Welcome to God's Way Community Church. Thank you for joining us today. Amen. We thank God for you being with us. We hope that God is blessing you and your family and taking care of you and everything is fine. Amen. That you're in good health and in good spirits. Amen. That the, that the Lord is keeping his hand on you through uh, these trying times. And we thank God for you. We appreciate those of you who are praying for us and we appreciate the people who have so diligently adjusted their lives to be able to accommodate uh, us to try to bring forth the Word of God and to have Bible studies uh, while we're having uh, this uh, adjusted type of uh, setting but not being able to gather in our assembly. So we thank God for that. We thank God for you. We hope and pray that the messages and the Word of God that has gone out that have, uh, have blessed you and blessed your family. We pray that the Word is doing what it is designed to do in your heart. Amen. Remember to allow the Word of God to be mixed with faith. Amen. And it will help you. Amen. We thank God for that. So we just like to let you know we appreciate you for your prayers. We appreciate those of you who have uh, supported with your finances, your time, your energy. Amen. That God, the Bible says, will not forget your labor of love. Amen. We won't either, and we know that God will not. So we thank God. We pray for you, and may God lift this face up to you and bless you and keep you and give you, amen, peace during this time. So we're going to go into our uh, Word of God today, and uh, we, we hope we don't uh, uh, take too long. Amen. The priest, and uh, some people are really busy nowadays and all this sort of good stuff. And things aren't like they were years ago where the preacher would preach for hours and, uh, and uh that, that kind of reminds me of uh, something I heard once about a uh, preacher who was kind of long-winded, and he was preaching uh, quite a while, and the people uh, in the audience were staring around, and uh, so he got to his one a couple of points in there, and he said, now what are we going to do about this man Moses? And uh, one of the people in the audience stood up and turned around and said, well, you can let him have my seat because I'm going home. <laughs> So uh, we hope uh, we don't want uh, we want to preach to you, but we don't want to be so long, amen. That somebody wants to turn off the video, amen. <laughs> so we hope that God will bless us with that, amen. At the same time, we pray His anointing on us today. Turn in your Bibles if you're you're looking on and you have your Bible in you with you. Turn in your Bible to the Book of Revelation, chapter number three, verse number one through and including three. We're going to read a few of those scriptures there. Not a lot of reading. But we certainly hope that it will drive the point home and set the foundation for what we're going to preach today. All right. So it says here in the book of Revelation, chapter number three. And unto the angel of the church of Sardis write, These things said he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. Amen. I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest and art dead. Verse number two. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. Let's go on and read verse number three. Verse number three says, Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Amen. Pray with me while you stand or while you're just listening in your living room. Amen. That God's blessing will be upon. Amen. The message. Father, in the blessed name of Jesus, we give you the praise and glory. And God, we ask that you anoint the speaker of the word. Anoint the hearers of those who are going to hear it. Let your word go down into our hearts, God, and, and stimulate us that we will want to do your will. Let no flesh be on display. And God, let your spirit have its way in this place. That those that hear the word of God may be enriched, may be blessed, that you will get the glory. And we give you the praise and the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, 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 amen. So we thank God, amen, Jesus' name, amen, for the word. Revelation chapter number 3, verse number 1, we're including 3, and we thank God for that. I'd like to uh, start off today, amen, with this uh, uh, message today. Uh, strengthen the things which remain. Amen. Strengthen the things which remain. Coming from verse number two, be watchful and strengthen the things which remain. Amen. I, I, I don't know about everybody because I don't know everybody, but I can imagine that what I'm about to say is true for most of us or most people, especially adults. 
Amen. That most of us probably can remember at some time that we have uh, launched into some sort of uh, project or something that we desire. And that uh, maybe we were pursuing a career, or maybe uh, we were looking after a, a, a trying to be, get married to our spouse. Some of us know how that is, and we were pursuing, amen, that young lady that we said was of our dreams, amen. And some of us may even have, remember, uh, wanting to come to God. And some of us can remember uh, seeking after the Lord, crying and weeping and asking God, Amen, amen, in the middle of the night, amen, that, that we can be saved. I certainly remember uh, my early time of coming to the Lord and, and driving up into the wilderness in the mountains and being there in Yosemite Mountains at night talking to the Lord about my condition. I remember doing that when I was just 21 years old. And so uh, I remember how that was. And so most of us remember that when we achieved and when we found that thing that we were after, uh, how our hearts were lifted up and how we were so excited about what we found. And we, and we got married and we landed that job and now we're, uh, we're saved and baptized and filled the Holy Ghost and, and man, we're on cloud nine. And, and then, uh, and as time goes on, I think we can all say that, uh, that after a while, something happened over time that, uh, that there seemed to be, amen, that, 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 that the fire, that vision, that passion we had wanes sometimes. Sometimes we get to the point that we, we don't feel like we have that energy of gusto, or that zest that we used to have to chase after that thing the way we did. And, and sometimes that can work to our detriment. And, and so uh, if you know what I'm talking about, then you know that at one point, either one or two things occur. Either we begin to lose our focus and interest so much that after a while we turn to something else, or after a while we, we forget our commitment, or after a while uh, we forget that we were supposed to be, uh, and we wanted this, and after a while things aren't like they used to be, and we lose hope and we lose heart. Either that happens, or all we begin to do what some people do, and I hope that there are many of us who can say amen on this. We begin to think about the fact that, well, you know what, I don't feel as charged as I used to. I don't feel as good about it as I used to, amen. Amen. I, I, something is going on and I need to find a way to, to, to strengthen myself. And, and so, so, uh, so the other thing that happens is if we look the other way, we say, you know, I'm not going to let this happen to me. Uh, we begin to take measures and steps and we begin to investigate and we begin to say, I need to do something to, to, to charge myself up and, and give myself energy uh, and, and get back to where I need to be. Uh, may, hey, maybe that's a recommitment to the word of God. Uh, maybe it's a recommitment to our spouse or a recommitment. Uh, uh, years ago, my wife and I had reached our 20, 20th anniversary. That was uh, over 11 years ago. We reached our 20th anniversary uh, and I remember us having a big thing for that. And then when we reached our 25th anniversary, we had a big uh, celebration for that and we renewed our vows. Amen. We went over them again. Amen. Uh, why? Because 25 years is a good while. Amen. Sometimes we might forget certain things. And, and so most of us know what it is, is what I'm saying, to, to lose passion for something and, and lose our vision and need to get refocused. And that is the essence of my, my message today is, is that God is trying to tell us to, in the church that we are, have lost a lot of what he left the church with. Amen. The church, amen, that started off with a bang. 3,000 souls came in in one day. Amen. And God left it in good hands and uh, he put it in a place where it was supposed to take off and grow. And, and yes, it has expanded. But over the years, something has happened. Uh, while men slept unawares, they saw him come in uh, and begin to teach damnable heresies. And various things have gone on for the church of God. And so we are finding ourselves slipping away. So then we have in our text today as we come to our text, uh, John the Revelator as he is commonly called because of his writing of the book of Revelation. We know that he was exiled to the Isle of Patmos. Amen. And John the Revelator being the, the one apostle of the twelve. Amen. That we know that did not die a martyr's death. 
We know that he lived a long time, an old age, amen, and that he died being an old man. But while he was exiled at this island, uh, which is located somewhere near the area of Turkey right now, in present-day Turkey, while he was there at this island in isolation and breaking bricks into little blocks and, and, and being there on this island with other prisoners that were exiled, God spoke to him and gave him the words that we now call the book of Revelation. Amen. I want to let you know something today. No matter how isolated you think you are, God knows your number. Amen. He's able to find you and he wants you to do a work for him. And no matter where you go, he's able to pull you up and give you an assignment. Amen. I want you to know that, that God keeps his hand on you and he knows where his servants are and he knows how to call you up and when to give you the work to do. So he tells uh, John here, he says, I want you to write the things that I'm going to tell you and put them in a book. I want you to know this. Uh, this is very important, saints, that we hear what uh, he has said. So he begins to talk to the churches and uh, he begins to send the letters to the seven churches in Asia. This is what I want you to do. I want you to send these letters to the church of Asia and let them know, he says, uh, write the things that thou hast seen and the things that which are and the things which shall be thereafter. Now, uh, it's important to understand is that we get a lot of symbology here in the book of Revelation, but as John began to tell us in Revelation chapter number one, he said, I saw him and he, he said, write this to, uh, to the stars uh, of the seven candlesticks. John said, I, said, I looked around and I heard a voice and I, I saw him uh, and his head was, uh, head was white as wool and his feet was as someone who had been burned in the furnace and he had a golden girdle about his back uh, and, I, I, and he knew that he was Jesus and he heard the voice and said, I am the Alpha and the Omega and I am the beginning and the end and I want you to write these things and put them in a book and so he began to tell them about the faith of the, of the, the churches of Asia now we need to understand now the, the, the stars that he is talking about in the church represent the ministers or the preachers somebody say amen amen the ministers are the preachers and he said I want these letters to go to them well why them well, that's a very good question. Huh? What well, uh, Paul said in Hebrews chapter number 13, verse 17, that they are they that must give an account. Hello, somebody. I, I want to let everybody know that as a pastor, as a preacher, I, I have no illusions about my responsibility. One day God is going to ask me, how did you feed my sheep? One day he's going to ask me, did you live holy so they will know what holiness was? One day he's going to ask me, what did you do to those that were broken and wounded? One of these days he's going to ask me, did you scatter my flock? So I want you, John, to write this in a book. Take it to the star. Give it to the one that's in the church that's responsible. Can I help somebody now? Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost coming on. Somebody's going to wonder one day why they didn't make it to the Lord. And he's going to tell you because you, you disregarded my pastor that I put in there. You wouldn't hear the shepherd that I gave you. The under shepherd. You wouldn't hear him. You would do, do what you wanted to do. But I gave you a star. I gave you a shining star that he could feed you with knowledge. Oh, somebody. But somebody's going to find out that they have disregarded God's system and they have polluted God's way and they have torn down his system and they're not going to find what they think they're going to find when God asks them, how come when I sent somebody to you, you wouldn't hear them? So then we see John is given the task to write to the churches. Give it to the minister. He must give account. I want you to come to understand that as John is getting this, he tells John that the churches need to remember what they heard and what they received. Then he calls them and says, repent. Help us, Lord. Now these seven churches that were in Asia were seven, seven physical churches. But what he tells those churches is related to us today. Because we are in the same state. Now hear me somebody. The Apostle Paul wrote that the things that were written of old, the book of Romans, were written for our learning. That we can read those things and we can understand and have hope. Well, I'm going to tell you something, saints. When Paul wrote that, we know that he was talking about the Old Testament 
Because that's what they had. Now we have the Old Testament and the New Testament. So if God has given us all this to learn by, we're not going to have any excuse for not knowing what the Lord has said to us. Hello, somebody. So he said, I want you to write this because these churches, even though they're in the, the, the book of Revelation, and book of Revelation has much prophecy to it, and some of what John saw, what he wrote, has not yet happened yet. And all of it has not been fulfilled. But we are living in the last of the last days. And we are coming close to the fulfillment of it. But watch this. But the churches of today in the body of Christ are still in some of the same sort of condition that we read about the seven churches in Asia. Some are lukewarm. And when you read the whole list that he gives you from chapter 2, they were in various states of disrepair. Some were pure and some were not. Some were, had one thing wrong and some had another. But uh, the Lord began to deal with them because they were in various places. The same is true today. We have some churches that are holding up the blood stand down. Praise God for those churches. We have some churches that are still hanging on to the doctrine that was preached on the day of Pentecost. I thank God for those churches. We have some churches that say, I'm still preaching baptism in the name of Jesus because he's the only God that can save anybody. Thank God for those people. We have some churches that have gone on and they begin to pollute and dilute. Some have sold themselves to money, filthy lucre. Some have decided that they want popularity more than they want Jesus. Some have decided that they want to mix and match and change the church of God around. Hello, somebody. It's a sad affair, but they're in different states. But here's what I want you to know. Jesus knew where all of them were. He knew where they all were. No matter what your spiritual condition God knows all about it. And he said then, in Revelation chapter 3, verse 2, be watchful. He's talking to the church of Sardis. He said, be watchful and strengthen the things that remain. And herein we take our text. Because even though the church of Sardis was the only one that received that particular phrase, that phrase is applicable to all seven churches as it sums up the very thing that is wrong with them and what they need to do to get right with God. Be watchful and strengthen the thing that remain. Then he says, that is ready to die, for I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou wilt not watch, I will come upon thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know that what hour I will come upon thee. Now I want us to know something, and this is going to take us toward the end of our text shortly. But I want us to understand something that's going on before we leave today. When we begin to read what John said to these churches, there are a couple of things that stand out very specifically to me. Number one, right off the bat, Jesus sends the message to the church. Hello, somebody. He does not send the message to the sinner. Hello. He sends the message to his church. Why send the message to the church? I want to help somebody. Contrary to what many people think or act like, the church has never been designed by the Lord to take dictation from the world. In fact, the church is supposed to lead the world. Sometimes we don't know if the world is leading or we're just following along. But according to what the Bible shows me, the church is supposed to be the head. The church is supposed to be the transcendent, not the trend follower. The church is supposed to be the one that has the light in its midst. Jesus being the one that gives us our being. Hello, somebody. I don't know about you, but the church gets its glow from the Lord. And if we begin to take our cue from the world, we won't have the Lord in our midst very long. Because he said, I'll come among you and remove your candlestick. Let me tell you something, friend. That God went to his people first. Hello, somebody. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Some of us want the world to get right. But until the church gets right, right. The world can't get right. The church, when it is crooked, must be straightened out by the Lord. And once the Lord straightens her out, she will begin to shine. 
message first. Uh, send it to my ministers. Uh, send it to my people. Uh, send it to the church. We see this theme carried out throughout the entire Bible. Jeremiah chapter 44 and verse number 4. He said, I sent you prophets to, to tell you not to turn to this abominable thing. Rising early and sending them one after the other. Amen. We see that theme followed all over the Bible. God didn't send his men and his prophets as prophetess. He didn't send them. Yes, some of you preachers, there were women who were prophetess. And he didn't send them just to some heathen nation. John came out of Patmos off the island. He didn't tell John to go to some heathen nation. Go to the church. Amen, somebody. Wake the church up first. First Corinthians chapter 16. Paul tells us it's high time that we awake out of sleep. Go and wake the church up first. Because when my bride gets stirred up, when she gets her garments on, when she begins to do right and walk right and look right and love right, oh my God in heaven, go to the church, John. Show them that they're doing wrong. And if we can get them right, then the world might have a chance. I want to tell you something, somebody. Until you live for God, your family doesn't have a chance. If you want your family saved, you got to live for God. If you want your mother saved, you got to live for God. If you want your brother saved, you got to live for God. They don't have a chance until the church gets straightened out. Strengthen the things that remain that are ready to die. Hello, somebody. We know that the church must get right first. One preacher said it this way. Unless the people in the church begin to cry for revival, there will be no revival. I don't know why, but nowadays we don't even hear people talk about revivals. We don't even hear preachers say Let's get together and pray. Let's get on our knees and pray. We hear about people, I hear more people telling me about going to see a, a psychologist and a counselor. I wonder why it is. We'll go see a counselor and give a counselor. Now, somebody that's out there, don't let, I'm not trying to offend you if, you're, if your profession is, is counseling people. They have their place. But somebody will go sit on the couch, lay down on the couch and give a counselor $100 for an hour. But they won't get on their knees, Mr. Bacon, for one hour and talk to the Lord. Prayer is some of the best counselor you can get. And you can get a hold of God. You can get the best advice there is. And it won't cost you a dime. But I want you to know that somebody that willing to go to the counselor. But the counselor of counselors uh, is saying, Church, uh, I want you to strengthen what remains. Uh, you don't pray to me like you used to. You don't love me like you used to. Uh, I'm feeling cold and abandoned over here because the church, uh, the one I love, uh, is broken down and torn down. Uh, the people are running in and out, uh, doing what they want to do. Uh, but I need somebody, John, uh, to take the message to my folks uh, and let them know it's time to wake up uh, and strengthen those things that remain. We want the world to get a revival. I hope God give me a revival. I pray, I don't know what you pray, you can pray whatever you want. <laughs> you can pray whatever you want. But I ask God to give me fire. Give me a revival, give Brother Bacon a revival. B-A-C-O-N, no, Brother Roy Bacon. Don't let it fall on that guy. Give me revival. Cause I am under the persuasion. Now I don't know a lot of things. But I used to dabble around and play with little fires when I was a kid. Most kids do. And the last time I checked, it's not too hard if you got one fire started to set something else ablaze. Amen, somebody. So I think if God sent me a fire, somebody in the church would catch a blaze. I think if I get right, God will keep somebody else right. I think if I warm up, he'll turn somebody else a cold weedy into a hot dog. I think if I get right, God will change somebody. He'll do what we want him to do. John, send this message to the church and tell them, I want you to strengthen those things. They're falling apart and I need the church to leave for me. Hello, somebody. Hello. Hey, hallelujah. Glory to God. Send somebody. John, go to my folks. Go to the seven churches. Listen, we know that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. 
We see that in Romans chapter number 10. Amen. Verse number 17. Around that area. We know that that's true. But it takes more than us hearing that just the word and just reading. We've got to have it in our memory. We need to put it in our minds. It needs to be in our affections. And it needs to be in our practices. Come on, somebody. Amen. Some people are just church houses in name only. Hello, somebody. I don't ever want to be one of those. God help us that we never become just an empty shell. A building that's just there for good looks. We got good grass. The pavement looks good. Everything's nice on the outside. The paint's good. But there's no lamp glowing on the inside. There's no holiness that resonates in the world. There's nobody crying that my Lord is my God. And we're going to live for him. It's time for us to strengthen those things that we are allowed to slip out of our fingers first. Come on, somebody. Send John to my church. Get my church straightened out. And then the world might have a chance. I would hate to get to heaven and somebody taps me on the shoulder and say, I just want to show you something. Those people over there now, I got the word in the scripture that we're going to be able to see them across. And they're going to be able to see us. But they that want to go there from here cannot. Hello, somebody. And they that should, would want to come from there to here cannot. But there's a great gulf. I don't want somebody to tap me on the shoulder and say, Brother Bacon, because you wouldn't pray for that person. Because you wouldn't have God uh, touch him. Uh, you wouldn't cry out in prayer. Then God didn't let him uh, be saved. Uh, he let him go on his way uh, because he heard no cry from you. Uh, let me tell you something. Let me stop right here for just a moment for station identification. Listen, when you read the book of Revelation and you read about the vials being up with this incense of the vials, uh, as that's in chapter 4, chapter 5, I believe, chapter 5, and you begin to read that John saw the incense and the vials, he tells you what that is, uh, that those vials and the incense uh, are the prayers of the saints. Hello, somebody. God wants his people to know uh, you need to strengthen what that remains. Uh, you, whatever is going on, uh, the building is starting to go into decay. Uh, but listen, you don't have to let it fall away. Way. You can call a prayer meeting. Uh, oh, listen, somebody. We can call a fast. Uh, I remember when he told Jonah, go to Nineveh and tell the Ninevites, uh, I'm going to destroy this city. And Jonah, when he went there, you know what Jonah did? Jonah didn't look for a church when he got there. He didn't look for a building to set up. He didn't look for some mall to go to or some place where he could be comfortable. No, he didn't hire a horse or a carriage. He starts preaching the minute he walked into town. As soon as he got past the, 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 the limit sign, oh, welcome to Nineveh. Oh, you need to be saved. He went to preaching right away. Why? Because this thing was serious. They needed to strengthen those things. And God was coming through after a while. Saints, we need to understand there's an urgency here. That's what our problem is. We've got so cushy in our homes, so relaxed in our Cadillacs, and we've gotten so kicked back, and we don't know that God is coming soon, that we're at the end of the year's end, and that we need to get ready for God. He needs somebody to awaken the church, not the sinner man. The church needs to be awakened so we can strengthen those things that are falling apart. The prayers were in those vibes of the saints. The prayers go up to God. We have time for so many other things, but we don't have time to spend time with God. I wonder what he must be thinking. This is why we had the condition of these churches that were in such a horrible state. Now, when he gives them this assessment, God's assessment of the churches, thank you, Lord, it reminds me, his assessment reminds me of when I was in grade school. In grade school, the teacher every now and then would come around and she would have a piece of paper and she would show us what our present grade was and she would let us know that you're either not doing so well and if you don't get in gear, you're not going to make it through. Every now and then, she would call us up one at a time. Come up to the desk, I want to show you something. And we, yes ma'am. And she let us look over into her record book 
and she would have her finger and she would go down and show us our, her, our name. That's what you have right now. Oh my goodness. And I said, some people come back from the desk with their head down. I know what it's like. I was one of those one time. And my head down. Why? That brain was horrible. And some was so bad, you'd hear them whisper, her whisper to them, I want to see you after the class. Some were even worse than that. They were so bad that you'd go out in the hall and she'd be telling them, I'm going to have a meeting with your parents. We need to call them in. They had fallen so bad in disrepair that their brains were horrible. Some had no chance. Of uh, just a twinkling, uh, and you'd hear some of them after, after school or uh, after the class is over. Can I do some extra assignments? Uh, is there something I can do to bring it up? Uh, I'll at least give them credit for that. Uh, some were eager, and they said, Oh, Miss So and So, uh, if you'll give me a chance to do these extra assignments, uh, I'll do right. Uh, I heard her tell somebody one time, uh, You need to stop playing so much in school uh, and stop talking so much back there. Uh, so what am I saying? Uh, this assessment that he gave to the churches uh, reminds me of grade school. Uh, because when John went to the church, he, he said, some of you think you're good, uh, but you're no good. Uh, some of you think you got it down, uh, but you're just a clown. Uh, some of you are living uh, on high, but God's going to bring you low. Uh, some of you think you're rich, uh, but you're dirt poor in holiness. Uh, you're dirt poor in righteousness. Uh, you're dirt poor in love. Uh, you're dirt poor in and, 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 uh, reaching out to the poor. Uh, I think some of you need to know, he told the church, uh, that you really think you're doing it. Uh, but I have something against my bride. She's not what I wanted her to be. I want you to get it right. You need some extra work. Maybe some extra time on the prayer session. Maybe some extra fasting through the year. But whatever it takes, strengthen those things. They're falling apart. Strengthen them so that I don't have to come among you and separate you from myself. God wants somebody that's going to strengthen what's left. We can walk away from it. But I don't think that's what God wants. I know it's not. Nehemiah went back to Jerusalem. The king allowed him to do it when he was in exile. And Nehemiah's heart broke. And he saw the walls of Jerusalem torn down. And it smote him in his heart. He was a cupbearer. A cupbearer tasted all the king's food and everything before the king got a chance to taste it. But he was so heartbroken when he saw God's house, when he saw Jerusalem, he went back after his vacation and to get into the king's court. And the king said, wait a minute, how come you're coming in here with your countenance down like that? And he, the man, let me tell you something, you didn't approach a king looking sad. That could have been your last time to be sad about anything. And Nehemiah knew that. And so he was just honest. How can I, I, I'm sorry king, but my people's house is in so disrepair. The wall is torn down. Let me tell you what I know, saints. If the church will begin to cry and tell God, they'll help us fix the place. Help us repair the things that are broken. Show us how to do it, God. Open the word to us so we'll know what's wrong. God will touch somebody's heart and he'll show you the way. He told Nehemiah, go and fix your people's wall. Go and get it right. And Nehemiah said, wait a minute. Can I ask a little bit more? He said, say on, Nehemiah. Can you give me the lumber? Can you give me the tools? Can you give me the, the privilege? Can you write a letter to say I got the privilege to do that on your dime? I'm telling you somebody. If we don't get right with God, he'll help us fix the things that are in this for repair. If we love God enough, he'll send somebody along so that we can strengthen the things that are broken down. I need somebody who's going to strengthen the things that remain. Take the letter, John, to my church. Take it to my people. John does that. And it's a sad affair. The first thing that shows up in the list is two out of five churches. Two out of five didn't get a rebuke. Wow. What poor statistics. Two out of five. But then I heard Jesus. See, listen, I want to help somebody now. I know that there are a lot of people out there. Now, I'm not trying to... I'm not trying to put anybody down. 
I want everybody to be lifted up and look up to Jesus. But I want to tell you the truth. There are a lot of people out there trying to make you and I think that there's going to be a whole lot more people saved than there will be lost. Matthew chapter number 7 verse 13 and 14 does not declare that to be true. Read that at your leisure. Jesus said, enter ye in at the straight gate. For what? For broad is the gate and wide is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there will be that go in there at. Because straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leadeth to life. Few there will be that find it. Well, Brother Bacon, how many is few? I don't know. But right now, there's 7.9 billion people in the world. There are three, uh, 33 percent of those, or 30 percent of those, uh, say that they're Christian people. And of those 37 percent that I've read the statistics, uh, of the 80 percent that say they're real godly people, only about two percent or five percent actually go to church regularly, read their Bible regularly, and do the things that the Bible says uh, according to the statistics I've read, uh, friend. Uh, we need to strengthen some things. Uh, friend, uh, we need to build some things up. Uh, if those statistics are anywhere close, uh, we're in bad shape. Uh, we're in dire condition. Uh, it's time for the church uh, to gather around the prayer altar. To begin to cry and tell God, uh, help us. Uh, because this thing is falling apart. Uh, and we're watching it slip down the hill. Uh, we need to strengthen God's place. Take it to the church. Two out of seven. Two out of seven. Then the next thing comes to mind. I love what the Lord does. He tells them right off the bat. Listen. He that has an ear. You can read this later on in the same text we read. He that has an ear. Let him hear what the Spirit said to the church. I love the way God does it. Does this. This is in chapter 2 when you're reading in all the churches. He tells them. Hear what the Spirit said to the church. What are you trying to say, Pastor Bacon? Everybody's got ears. Well, it's one thing to have a set of ears in your head, but it's another thing to have ears to hear. Hello, somebody. In other words, I want everybody, Jesus is saying, whatever race you are, whatever color you are, whatever nationality you are, understand what I'm telling you. And then there is a deeper setting. We've got to have some spiritual discernment to understand when God is talking to us. We need somebody that has ears to hear. We need somebody in the church who said, wait a minute, this place is falling apart. This ship is going in the wrong direction. We need somebody. Is there anybody out there who understands what I'm talking about? I don't want to be on a ship and before I know it, it's half sunk and nobody sound the alarm. Come on, somebody. We need uh, to strengthen what remains. Uh, somebody needs to have some spiritual discernment and say, oh, I think we're going in the wrong way. Uh, oh, I think we're taking on things that's not good. Uh, oh, I think the damnable heresies are taking over. We need somebody that's going to strengthen that which remains. Let them hear what the Spirit said to the church. God wants somebody in his church. Now, get me. Hear me. We can't go outside the church and find somebody that can hear that. We need to have some spiritual discernment among the people in the church. Hell, hello, somebody. Then number two, he says this. He gives them a remedy. Praise God Almighty. This is what I love about Jesus. He never condemns without giving us a chance to get right what we got wrong. Somebody ought to say amen. You ought to be shouting if you're a rank sinner, you ought to be glad God loves you enough to tell you that you need to repent. I know I'm glad that he tells me, Brother Bacon, you need to get on your knees. When I'm wrong, he lets me know and smokes me in my heart that I have to fall on my knees and say, God, help me. What a worm I am. You ought to be glad that he gave us the remedy. Repent, therefore, he said. Or go ahead and repent. Do the first works. Return to what you used to do. Do the things that you know are right. Strengthen those things that are remained. But the entire message he gives them for the remedy is repent. Let me tell you something. We're not going to fix a thing if we don't start with repentance. There's not a thing that's going to... Can I help with somebody? You that are in video land. Can I help you? You see, what some of us want to do, now maybe it's not you, but what some of us want to do is we want to skip over repentance and go to rejoicing. Hmm. I even say a different way. We want to skip revival and go to evangelism. Hmm. 
You can't have evangelism until you get revived. Until somebody resuscitates us from our dead spirit and dead works, going and alienating ourselves in wickedness of our own mind. How can we have evangelism? How can we reach the lost? When Paul said that my gospel is hid, it's hid to them that are lost. I can be in the church for 50 years and don't know that Jesus is the Father. Don't know that Jesus is the Son. Don't know that Jesus is the Holy Ghost. Don't know that there's only one name and one throne. And don't know that baptism will take away my sins. And that gospel is lost to me. I don't know it at all. Listen, friend, we have to get revived first. Then we can evangelize. If we don't have that, we're fooling ourselves. Jesus didn't tell John, I know I gotta end this up, somebody got something else to watch. Jesus didn't tell John to go and send the folks in town and let them start evangelizing. He said, go to my people and tell them to repent. You can't even do a work for me when you're not right. Hello, somebody. This is why I'm gonna try to help somebody right now. This is why. We have to make sure that people are saved before we turn them loose all over God's house. Because you can have something that's holy. It's like we used to have a dog named Rover. And he would run out into the woods all the time. And Rover would come back with ticks all over. And sometimes we wouldn't see some of them. We think they got them off. You know what I mean? We see the obvious ones. And then we start playing with him and wrestling in the yard when Rover was a big dog. We could play with him like that. And he would pull us around on these little carts and things. He was a good dog. Oh, he's a very good dog. And so we would play with Rover. And every now and then we'd say, come here, boy, let me play with your ears. And we'd be playing with our dog. And we'd find one of those big ticks way behind the ear down in the hair. He had some long hair on the German Shepherd. He had that hair down in the And, oh, you got another one of these ticks in here. And we'd have to get that one out. Why? Friend, when you're not living right, your soul is back. It's full of ticks. And sometimes we can't see them all. Sometimes the pastor missed some. We need God to do an inspection like he did with the churches. Go find. I them. Tell them all to come clean. Tell them to repent before they can start doing the work. Strengthen that thing from the ground up. You got to get it right on the inside. Proverbs 28 and 13. He that confesses his sin and forsaketh them shall have mercy. But he that concealeth it will not. God will not going to give you any mercy. But if you want to repent, you got to confess and forsake. We need to strengthen what's remained. Can I help somebody? There's a lot of preachers that need to repent. There's a lot of teachers that need to repent. There's a lot of big deacons that need to repent. There's a lot of church members that need to repent. We need to start from the head down and say, God, what's going on? Now you, uh, if you're a pastor or preacher, you can just disregard anything I'm about to say. And you whatever you want to do because that's your church. But I come and pray and ask God, don't let me get up here on this pulpit with sin in my heart. Don't let me come here talking to two people about taking care of their wives and I'm beating mine at the house. Don't let me go that way, God. Oh, no. Don't let me have hatred in my heart for somebody in the audience. Even if they despise me, teach me how to love them. Why? Because the people don't want a pastor with ticks in his heart. They need a clean word from the clean God. They need the lamp that's shining bright. And I need to strengthen if those things are in the way. Build them up. Start from the ground up and get the repentance going. You know what I like about God? He is never in a hurry to pass judgment. He's never in a hurry. You go into the Old Testament, look at the Ammonites and the Moabites, and God gave them hundreds of years. Five, six, seven, some 800 and something years to get it right until it was over. God is not in a hurry to punish you. You know why? He loves you. I'll take you for a minute. Can I have just a couple more minutes? I'll take you back to my schoolyard experience. See, children would get upset, and some of them would even get upset with the teacher. The teacher didn't give them that grade just because she didn't like them. They earned it. And they were getting mad with the teacher. The teacher didn't do that because she was trying to hurt them. She was trying to show them this is where you are. You need a checkup. And some of us need a checkup from the neck up. And so that we can let God know. Hey, you, I got it in my head, and you need to fix my thinking so I can understand it's not your fault, God, that I'm not living right. I did this to myself. 
The teacher wouldn't do anything to me. She was just showing me what my grade was. Why? She wanted all her students to do well. I don't know. I told my son one time. He said, Dad, is the teacher. The teachers, they don't like me. I said, son, let me tell you something. I don't know your teacher. And I don't know what kind of person she is in general and all that kind of stuff. Specific, anything specific about her. But I can tell you what I do know about teachers. Most teachers, first of all, love teaching. Or they like it enough that they feel that what they have to share with their students is worth their time. And most of them care enough about the student that they'll spend time after school. They'll come in early in the early hours. I've seen them do it too many times. Now, I'm not saying every teacher is like that. But most of them that I've run into, they care enough about the student that if you just want to try to do right, they'll have to strengthen yourself so you can get moving. Because they don't want to see you fail. God's the same way. He don't want to see his church obliterated. He don't want the lamp turned off in our life. He wants us to be able to be strong. But we got to strengthen some things that are messed up and get them right so that God can stay among us. And then the last thing he does, which I love this part, I love it. Chapter number two, you read that. Chapter number two, he begins to get those lists down there. You read that at your leisure. But in chapter number two, he tells them the remedy. And then he tells them the reward. If you'll do that, to him that overcometh, I'll let him eat manna. Him, the new man. Him that overcometh, he'll sit down with me in my throne. As I am sit down in my father's throne, look out somebody. He that overcometh, I'm going to give him a new name that nobody's going to know. Him that overcometh, I'm going to bless him. Listen, God gave you, gave you and told us what's wrong. Told us what to do to get it right. Then he told us what is going to happen if we overcome. I'm so glad that Jesus is not ready to put a stop to the church, but he wants us to be overcomers. He wants us to go and fix those things that are broken down to repair those things. It's not time to put away the prayer meeting. It's not time to put up the Bible. There's some people who are quit reading the Bible. Friend, that's a mistake. There's some that don't study the Bible. Some that get a little bit of Bible study once every month or two. I'm telling you right now, friend, you need to strengthen that. Whatever is going wrong, you need to understand that until we begin to strengthen God's church, our ability to reach the world is not going to be anywhere near what God wanted it to be. Strengthen those things that remain. Don't discard them. Don't just throw your hands up in the air. And some people do this. Oh, it's all lost. It's a lost cause. And I believe that's where some people's hearts are. They think it's just a lost cause. Friend, let me tell you something. Jesus declared that upon this rock I shall build my church. And the gates of hell shall not what? Prevail against it. Now let me help us all right quick before I sign off. You and I might not make it in that church because we may not come up to standard. And if we don't come up to standard, he's going to give us a chance to get it right. And after that, he said, I'm going to come among you and turn off your light. So I can tell you one thing. The church is going to prevail over the enemy. We just need to let, let the world know that we're going to be a part of this church. And we're going to do it the way God wants it done. And the things that are not right, thank God he sent us a Bible. Thank God he sent us a preacher to tell us that get right was wrong. Thank God he gave us repentance. Thank God he put baptism in there. Thank God he's still giving people the Holy Ghost. Don't you let people tell you that God's still not pouring out the Holy Ghost. Don't you let anybody ever sell you that pig in the blanket. He's still pouring out the Holy Ghost. We're still in the New Testament church that was founded on the day of Pentecost. Hello, somebody. And I would love anybody who would like to ask the question to show me that, to call me, and I'd be glad to share it with you. Scholar or not, we're still in the same church. And until God changes our time and we come out of this session, he's going to still be giving people the Holy Ghost. Oh, I know the latter rain was uh, back in 1900 and the whole time came out, we went to the dark ages, and I get all that. But that doesn't mean he's still not giving people the Holy Ghost who are seeking after him. Don't let anybody sell you on that. Thank God he gave us the remedy. See, we need to strengthen those things. Some people get mad because we still preach in Jesus' name. They don't even want to hear that anymore. Some people don't want us to talk about baptism. Some people don't want to hear the word holy. 
People, we're going to a heaven where there's a holy God. And the angels around the throne all the time go, holy, holy, holy. I don't even know why people even want to go. <laughs> We're going to a place where there's a holy God. Hello, folks. He's always been holy, and he's going to be that. And the Bible says, holiness without no man shall see the Lord. It's still right. And we still have to cry out loud and tell the devil, we're God's church. We made some mistakes. We've fallen down. But we're going to start strengthening those things. Get your hammer and your nails out. What is that, Brother Bacon? Your knee pad so we can get on the prayer. We can get on the altar. This is why they told us years ago, don't preach too long, Pastor. So why is that? Preach too long, people don't want to go to the altar. They want to go home. I get it. I remember when I was a little boy, I went out to the desert. Not the desert, but it was in Georgia, so it was in an orange grove. They had a tent meeting out in the orange grove. Sawed us all on the ground. Chairs everywhere. I said, man, what in the world? I was 12 years old, and I'll never forget that tent meeting. It was hot. But you know what? God was hot. The Holy Ghost was powerful. You can feel the Spirit of God. Now, if I look at that clock and you've been there for 30 minutes, it's time to turn you off. Oprah's coming home. Come on, somebody. It's time for us to strengthen what remains so that we can get God back in the house so that he will come among us, stay among us, dwell among us, be our God, and we can be his people. Strengthen that word which remains. Strengthen it. Don't weaken it. Don't get rid of it. Build it up. Don't keep trying to tear it down. Get it where it's supposed to be. You might have to prop something up for a while until you can get it stayed in the ground like a post, until you can get it solid. Do that if you have to. One person said one time, you've got to come to church and sit on the back pew. Just don't backslide. Sit on the back pew if you have to until God gives you enough power to overcome that thing that's bothering you so you can move on up, get closer to the fire. But whatever you got to do, strengthen that which remains. God's counting on us. Amen? He's counting on his church. He's counting on his people. He's counting on you and me who live for God, who love God. And I can tell you something else. When God's church gets straightened out, many that are in the world who don't know God are going to have the light shining to them. And the souls are going to be changed. The closer we get to God coming, I can tell you right now, there's going to be some people that's going to wake up. And we need to be in a place with the church that we can help them wake up and stand up. Strengthen those things that remain. I hope this message helps you. I hope it blesses your soul. I hope it inspires you, motivates you, causes you to want to run to God. If you don't have to get a hold of him so that he can save your soul. Get baptized. Filled with the Holy Ghost. Don't let anybody tell you that you don't need to be born again. I have to throw that in before I leave. You must be born again. One preacher said it this way. You've got a better chance of sailing across the Atlantic Ocean in a paper boat than you do of getting into heaven without being born again. Don't let anybody tell you that you don't need that. Strengthen that thing. Get to God. Be revived. And then we'll evangelize. In Jesus' name. And God bless you.